Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm very excited and very happy to be here. Um, it's a real honor to speak to you in Moscow. I've been in Moscow three times. It's the third time I've been here. First time I came was about 21 years ago. And um, I uh, adopted a son from Siberia. And we came through Moscow. And that son is right back there. His name is Elia. <laughs> And he's 22 now, so it was a successful experience. Um, I'm going to, I think, mostly sit down, because we walked around all day. Uh, and I'm a bit tired, but it'll be great. Um, well, I think uh, I, I will tell you, I would like to tell you a little bit about what my job is. I, I really liked the theme of the, uh, of the talk, that my job is to work with geniuses. So we'll see about that. But, um, so I guess I'll start with just how I got into the career that I, that I have. I'm a film editor. So um, I'm originally from San Francisco. My original interest in the arts was in music. Um, I studied guitar and I was a songwriter. And then I got interested in film uh, as a way, I actually music video in the, in, the, in the 1980s in the United States was a, was a, just seemed like a very interesting possibility um, for filmmaking. Uh, I don't know if you know what, what you would, if you would call them music videos, but just films based on pop songs. Um, and so I, I saw that as a really interesting possibility. It didn't end up being that interesting. Uh, music videos ended up basically becoming an advertising medium largely, but there are some amazing ones. So that's when I decided, that's when I started being interested in film. So I decided to go to film school. Uh, in the United States, right now, there are, there are many film schools. There are hundreds of film schools in the United States. But at that time, there were, this, this was 1982 is when I went to film school. And the sort of biggest ones is the ones in Los Angeles. That would be uh, uh, University of Southern California. Then there's University of uh, California, Los Angeles, UCLA. And then there's NYU, which is in New York City. So, um, the only one I applied to was NYU, and uh, the reason was I didn't want to go to Los Angeles. Um, it was this place I wanted to avoid. I wanted to avoid Hollywood. I wasn't interested in Hollywood films. I'm still not all that interested in Hollywood films, to be honest with you. Um, so at that time, I decided to go to uh, NYU, and it was a really fantastic experience. Um, it's, it's hard to imagine now when we have access to every film in the world you can find online somewhere. But in those days it wasn't like that. First of all, there was no online. Um, it was only the sort of beginning of VHS, video, home, uh, tape movies. And so going to New York City it was just a phenomenal place to study the arts, as I'm sure Moscow is because at that time they had what was called repertory cinemas. And a repertory cinema would be, I'm, I'm sure you have them here, but there was maybe 10 of them in, the, in New York in those times. When you, they would play double features, two films every night, uh, seven days a week. And it was an opportunity to see, to be exposed to films that I'd never heard of. I was, I didn't know much about film. I only knew a few Hollywood films. I only knew th the most exotic filmmaker I knew at that time was Stanley Kubrick. He was an amazing filmmaker, but not particularly exotic. So when I went to New York, I probably would say, without exaggerating, that in the first three years when I was in college, I probably saw a thousand films. And that was, that's what I remember most about the experience of studying film was seeing that many films and being open to things I had no idea about. For example, the filmmaker, the Spanish filmmaker, Luis Bunuel. I don't know if anyone who knows. Does anyone know who Luis Bunuel is? Excellent. Uh, if you don't, you should, you should watch some Luis Bunuel films. And of course, Federico Fellini. And of course, Andrei Tarkovsky. Um, I assume you all know who Andrei Tarkovsky is, right? Okay. Um, so that was really an eye-opening experience for me. Um, and, and, and it's interesting when you, when you get involved in film, it's, I always say it's, it's where you come in. 
And when I came, where I came in was what was the alternative interesting cinema was European Russian cinema. Today, if you come in in the United States, what you, what's interesting, what the alternative is, is documentary. It wasn't at that time. Documentary was a very small, it was, a, it was an existing thing, but it, it wasn't something you saw in theaters. Uh, there was what was called art house theater, uh, art house films, and that's these films that I became interested in at that time. And that always was my influence. I, I was always interested in narrative films as opposed to documentaries. I never studied documentary. I never really even saw documentaries, which is interesting because I am mostly now known as a documentary editor, but I will explain that. So, um, yeah, so New York was an amazing experience. NYU was an amazing experience. In the United States, there are two sort of levels of uh, college, uh, university for film studies. There's undergraduate and then there's graduate. Graduate school is generally for older kids, I mean people like say in their later 20s, who have decided that they want to have a career in filmmaking. And they will study one particular thing. You would study to be a camera operator or a camera uh, or a lighting, uh, lighting person or a director or a writer or, what ha or an editor. I didn't go to graduate school, I went to undergraduate school and I'm quite glad I did because it was a wonderful uh, experience in being uh, exposed to a lot of different things. So I took acting, I took screenwriting, I took um, editing, I took uh, directing, I took camera and I'm glad I was exposed to all of that. It was, it was a great education. And I made uh, two student films uh, when I was there. And they were, you know, very, <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking back on the student films, they were, I remember my teachers telling me that they were, you can make these films if you want, but they're, they're very complicated films, and it's not going to get you a job in the industry. I'm just telling you that. I had a teacher, actually, who, the two most influential teachers I had, one was Ukrainian, and the other was Russian who studied uh, at um, V, I, I forget what it's called, but the Moscow film, uh, VGIP, or what is it? And so he's the one who said to me when he read my screenplay, he said, uh, well, you are a very passionate young man, and I can tell you, I can tell you, have, you have passion for things, but I can also tell you, you have no talent for screenwriting. <laughs> and uh, I thought, wow, man. Um, that actually spurred me to make this film. I'm very glad I made my student film. He was right, nobody wanted to see it, but that's okay. You have to have, the, um, you have, to have somewhere to experiment. And that was one of my problems with film school generally now and even then. This is why I didn't want to go to film school also in Los Angeles, is because they're already gearing you toward working in the industry, in the film industry. And that's a very narrow focus and, and I didn't want that right away. And I was right about that. I'm glad I, I'm glad I didn't do that. So when I made my two student films, they were made, they were shot on 16 millimeter film and they were edited on what's called a flat bed. So I don't know how much I need to explain about what editing is. Um, I will assume you know nothing about what editing is. Okay, so what is editing? So someone goes out, well, let's say me as a student filmmaker, I write a, a script for a 20 minute film. I go out and film that with actors, or if it's documentary, it's not with actors. And I shoot, say, uh, six hours of film. And I'm going to make a 20 minute film out of that. So it's, that could be multiple takes, like you know, the, the person messes up the line in the first take, so you do another take. Or it could just be what they call coverage, which means, in a, in a very simple form, if, it's a, if we have a scene where there's two people talking, the classic Hollywood idea of what coverage is, is that we, you would have maybe four or five shots. One shot would be the two people talking, one shot would be a close-up of this person, a close-up of that person, perhaps a medium shot of each person, and the reason you do that is it, it's really for the editing, so that you can speed up the performances by, by tightening the pauses, or you can slow them down, 
or you can make the scene not even about words. You can, you can just make it about the looks that people give each other. It's a very interesting thing because in my professional life, uh, working on narrative films or scripted films, I've said to many people, the main job that you do when you edit a feature film, like the one you will see tonight, is a, if you go see this film, is a perfect example. The main thing that I did was cut dialogue out, cut out the talking. Because film is ultimately not a verbal medium. It's ultimately an image medium. Image meaning, of course, pictorial image, but also sound image, sound imagery. Is, is very important. Not just the sound of someone talking or the sound of specific sound effects, but you create whole worlds with sound and music. And, and they affect you um, in, your, in, your, in your unconscious mind more than um, pictorial images do. So in short, what the editor's job is, is to, in, in a scripted, format, like I just said, where you start with a script, is first you, you basically cut what the film was intended to be, the scripted thing, and then you say, well, it doesn't work, or this part doesn't work, or this performance is terrible, and I have to work around that. So that's a lot of what it was. So I did that on my first couple of um, student films. And, and as I said, I didn't study to be an editor. I studied film generally. The only thing I knew I, is that I wanted to be a filmmaker. And certainly had no intention of being an editor as a, a specific career. But I did find it was something that I could do and that I, was, I felt pretty good at. You know, I felt pretty good doing it. I felt I was accomplished at it. And so the first job that I got um, when I, when I, after university was to work for a news agency as a, as, a, as a video editor. Now, news agency sounds like it's a, a place where news is made. It is not that. I'm talking about an agent for news people. So an agent, like if you think in the sense of a Hollywood agent, meaning the person who makes deals for actors, well, uh, you know, news people have those too. And it was quite eye-opening to me to see how fabricated the news is in the United States. Um, that really, newscasters are largely performers. And this place that I work for literally coached them in how to, to, to uh, express the news, I guess you would say. And um, so my job was just to sort of cut these demonstration videos of how they, what they were like and, and, and this kind of thing. And I did that for about two years. It was kind of an awful job. But, uh, but I did, a after that I had done some editing and, and I guess at that point I was 28 or 27. And um, did the disc go out? It did. <laughs> did it go back on? Yes, okay. Um, I think I turned it off. Uh, so, I, I had, at that time I'd been in New York about 10 years and, it's, and I wasn't sure if I, I think it keeps going out now, maybe the battery is bad. Um, it's back on now. Um, at that point, uh, I had been in New York about 10 years and um, I decided, I don't think I, I intended necessarily, I, what if I just, do we need it? Try that one. How's that? Okay, this one's got a green light, so that must be good. Uh, okay, at that point I, I went back to my hometown of San Francisco. I don't think necessarily that I intended to stay there, but um, uh, it was the birth of, uh, it was the 90s, and it was the birth of digital editing. And so what is digital editing? It's computer-based editing. So instead of editing things on film. So when I was talking about my student film that was edited on film, that was literally strips of film that you physically cut, physically um, glued together, and that's how you did it. And so the interesting thing was that, like, about that sort of editing is that you have to do most, it's a very arduous form of editing. It's very difficult to actually do the physical edit itself, it takes time. So you learn to do the editing in your head, in your mind, 
to save time. And I think that's actually something I've, I've always, this always stayed with me, um, to imagine these things before you do them. Digital editing would be, the, you have all of that, I mean, you, I'm just, you know what, what, I, what this is, you must. It's just how you edit on your phone even. That is, the, the image is digitized, now it's shot digitally, but in those days it was shot on film and then transferred to digital. And with a computer, you can very quickly make a thousand different edits, you can try things a thousand different ways, and, and it's quite easy to do that. So it's another, another form of editing. In those days, uh, just by learning, I had friends who were software writers in San Francisco, and they had one of the early forms of what's called an Avid system, which is, a, which is an editing, uh, editing software. And they had one because they were writing software for it. And so I learned on it. They just let me use it. And based on that alone, I could get work because I could operate this thing. So it wasn't about the talent. It was about, at, at least at first, it was about just being able to operate a machine, and I think that's an, appoint, uh, an important point for young, young filmmakers. Sometimes it's that kind of thing. So I was quite proficient with it. And uh, so I decided to stay in San Francisco, and um, I and some friends started an editing company uh, together. And the funny thing was, this, this is really what led me into being an editor, and it was very, very much a detour. It was still not a conscious decision that I wanted to be an editor. We started this company with the idea that we would make our own films, and we would have access to not only um, film editing, but also audio editing and, and these kinds of things. And, and that was the original idea, but of course we took out loans and we, we, end, we ended up owing all of this money and then uh, meanwhile I had a son and meanwhile um, you know, I had bills to pay and so I started just doing the job. I just started editing other people's films, also did advertising, advertisements for a short period just as a way of earning money and it was literally a 25 year uh, detour. I never my whole career as an editor, I never considered myself as an editor. I always thought it was funny when, if I won awards or whatnot, whatnot, it always seemed a bit of a joke to me. Because most of my friends who are editors are very committed to being editors. And they're very proud of being editor. I'm, I'm proud of it. But I'm, I've always considered myself more a filmmaker than an editor, whatever that means. So I had this um, editing company in San Francisco and uh, as I said, I had never seen, I'd probably in my entire life seen three maybe document, theatrical documentaries. Certainly I'd seen documentaries that were on television, but I'd never seen the, really the classic documentaries or had any understanding of what they were. So I got a call um, once from a friend who said, there's a filmmaker in town who's, who's, who has a film that's half edited and he's, he, it's been half edited on Avid and he's looking for an editor uh, and it's a documentary, would you be interested? And I said, well, not really, you know, I'm, I don't do documentaries, and it, but, but who's the filmmaker? And he said, well, it's Werner Herzog. So I don't, how, how many people know who Werner Herzog is? No one, awesome. So Werner Herzog is probably one of the 20 greatest living filmmakers. You should definitely know who he is. He's made probably 60 films. Uh, he started in the 1980s. He's German. Uh, he was part of a, a movement uh, actually from out of Munich um, that was a very radical new wave movement of, uh, of a certain kind of filmmaking. And um, so he, by the time I met him, he, he'd made 30 films. He'd won Best Director at Cannes uh, for a film called Fitzcarraldo. You've never, you haven't heard of a film where a, where a man uh, pulls a boat over a mountain. Okay? So that's his, probably his most famous film. He worked with an actor um, named Klaus Kinski. 
Uh, and he was, he had a period where he was a pretty, in the, in the art house cinema, the, the kind I was talking about, that I was interested in. He was a very big name. And um, I certainly had seen his films and studied them in um, film school. But, um, but he also is one of the few filmmakers who will work in narrative, meaning fiction, and documentary, which is nonfiction filmmaking. So he, in his career, has probably had, I don't know, at least three significant relationships with editors in this early period of his career when he was doing largely narrative films. He worked with another editor in Munich. And then in this, in this later part of his career, in the 1990s, he had moved to the United States and he was chiefly doing documentaries. So that's when I connected with him. Uh, it was 1997. And um, we went on to make 27 films together, which is quite a lot. I worked with him for 18 years. Um, most of those films were documentaries. They weren't all documentaries. Um, they're very important films from that period. Um, there's a film called Grizzly Man, which is about a guy who gets eaten by a grizzly bear. <laughs> but it's uh, much more than that. And um, uh, a film called Little Dieter Needs to Fly, which is about a man who uh, was a, uh, an American soldier, in, uh, a, an American pilot, in the Vietnam War, and he was shot down in Laos. And the film uh, goes, takes him back to Laos um, 40 years later, and he tells the story of how he was shot down, how he was captured um, by the Viet Cong, how he uh, was in a prison camp, how he escaped from that camp, how he survived an ordeal in the jungle. It's a remarkable film. And it's largely just this man telling his story. So that was the first film that I worked on, the film that Werner came, I started our relationship with that film. And like I said, I, I, I wasn't so much interested in documentary. And then I saw this, this cut that he had, this edit, this first version of, of, his, of this film. And one of the things that stood out to me is it had a dream sequence in it. And I never imagined that a documentary, um, a nonfiction film, could have a dream sequence. Uh, it, it's just a different way of thinking about what documentary is. And I was immediately taken by that. And I was immediately taken by the possibility of it. The other thing is that all of these films that I worked on with him, the documentaries, are what's called unscripted. So that means, you know, in a, in a, in a, as I said earlier, in a fiction film, usually starts with somebody writing a script. This is what the people say, this is where they are, this is, they walk, you know, they're in Moscow and they come into the embassy and they say this and this is what happens. That's all written down. And then sometimes, and it's filmed, and sometimes you veer away from things in the script, but largely in scripted films, you stay with the script. It's a very efficient way to make films. It's how Hollywood has always made films, because it's efficient. You can say that, okay, this film's going to involve these 20 locations, it's going to involve this number of actors, it's going to involve these props, and you can budget all of that up front, and you can know that this is roughly what the film is gonna cost. But it, and, and you know, most of the films we've seen, all of us, have been that, and so um, it's, a, it's a good way to make a film. But it, it, the limitations are that there are a few surprises uh, in, in this kind of filmmaking. You're usually just trying to shoot what's on the page, what's on the written page. Then there's a form of filmmaking that's called unscripted filmmaking, and many documentaries are unscripted, meaning they had an idea for what the, the filmmaker had an idea about what the film was about. I just explained to you what Little Leader Needs to Fly is basically about. It's about a man telling a story about what happened to him in the war. And, and then you know, okay, well, we're going to take him back to these locations and he's going to tell this story. But um, the film is largely made in the edit room. It's only in the edit room when you look at all of the footage that you're able to that you make decisions about the dramatic structure of 
this film? What should be the first scene? What should be the second scene? What's the most, what's the emotional moment? Because always what we're trying to do is create emotion. So what we learn to do is to try to manipulate that and to uh, structure things for, for maximum impact. And I learned my skills as a dramatist through unscripted uh, documentary. So I mean, another advantage to that is that um, when you're a writer, um, when you're a screenwriter, it's a difficult job. Um, you're working with a blank page. You're imagining a film. Uh, you, you write this thing that you imagine. And even when you're writing it in the United States, you immediately have to think about, who's going to pay for this film? How am I going to get this film made? Who's going to give me money to make this film? So you immediately have to be thinking about, is it a commercial film? You know, are, are, are big name actors going to want to be in this film? Or, you know, if not, then that's another path. If so, that's another path. But you're already having to imagine this commercial, this, this film that needs to be, needs money to be, to, to come into being. That's not what it's like. And, and the other thing about that is it's all imaginary. So the other thing is that um, this is a story of most screenwriters in the United States. They write 10 screenplays and maybe one of them maybe gets made. Or maybe they write 10 screenplays and none of them get made. So you're working with the possibility of a film. When you're an editor, you're working with a real thing. You're working with real footage. And a lot of times you look at this footage and you say, I wish they had done other things. I wish they shot other shots. I wish that actor was a lot better. But the reality of what you have is in front of you, and you have to work with that reality. And that's a certain mindset, and that's the, the way I learned drama. So, so we had a, I mean, we had a very successful uh, relationship uh, together, and he's quite a bit older than I am. I don't work with him anymore. I, uh, I stopped working with him about two years ago. I moved to London, partly to get away from him. And um, we had an 18-year relationship. Um, it was, it, my son's entire life was uh, spent um, with Werner. He knows Werner quite well. Um, it was a very much like a, a, a friendship, also a, a sort of a fatherly kind of relationship. He was the father. Um, sometimes I was the father. Um, and a very close relationship. It took a long time to build trust in that relationship because he was a master filmmaker when I met him and I was not. <laughs> I was nothing even close to that. So the first five films, I would say, that we did together, I was quite intimidated by him. Um, this is another big part of what it is to be an editor. Uh, it's, it's, it's one thing, to all, the f all the things I'm talking about, what the job entails. Should we wait for that? <laughs> okay, keep going. It's one thing what the job entails. It's another thing um, what the psychological element is. Uh, because uh, largely what, what you must do is support... I can't talk over that, sorry. <laughs> Let me know if there's anything important we need to know. Right. Uh, there's, there's also the psychological element of it. You are, you are, you are, your job is to support someone else's creative vision. So that's, that's both wonderful and incredibly difficult. Because also, most of these people, uh, most of the great filmmakers that I've worked with, and I guess I've worked with three, um, are, are difficult people. They're, they're driven people, they have, art, they have artistic vision, they're not, they don't really care uh, necessarily about being polite or being pleasant. Um, what they care about is getting films made. And Werner was very much like that. Um, so for the first five films that I work with him or so, I just would dread every sort of moment, for example, like having a lunch together when we would have to make small talk 
I was quite intimidated by him and I, I, I didn't really know how to, it took a long time to get past that. Also, uh, creatively it was difficult for me because um, in, in the first several films, he, he, he did so many brilliant things. He had so many brilliant ideas. Just, just that it, it, so many ideas that when I would see it, I would just think, how did he come up with that idea? It's such a brilliant way to communicate something in a film. Um, but he would have other ideas that I just simply didn't agree with. And that's fine. That's part of the, your job is to, as an editor is to tell somebody when you don't agree with what they're doing or why you think that's not a good choice. But it's difficult in that circumstance because I, I was, it was difficult for me to do that. He was very intimidating. I learned that I could, let's say I had five things on my agenda in a particular scene. I had five things that I thought could be better or that were not good. I knew that there's no way that I could, could, could tell five things to him like that. But I could tell one or two in a day and then I could save the other ones and maybe I could try to get them in some other time. And I'm not even saying like, let's change this. I'm saying let's discuss changing it. Uh, that, um, the answer, from Werner's standpoint, the answer to every question is no. What I learned uh, after about 10 years was, he says that, but that's, he doesn't necessarily mean it, no. That's just the reaction, that's always his answer. So, <clears throat> we, so we made, uh, I would say about the halfway point of uh, uh, my career with him was that, you know, we made probably, by the time we'd made, say, 12 films together, I was getting pretty frustrated with the circumstance and I thought I was pretty much done with it. That I couldn't really bring him, bring the films up anymore. And then we had a film, that, uh, the one I mentioned earlier, which was called Grizzly Man. And um, this was a game, it was a, a significant change because we had a, a strong producer uh, for the first time. The producer is the person who puts, who funds the film. And there are different kinds of producers. Some producers will be involved in a film creatively. They will say, I, want, I would like you to do this. I would like the film to have this actor in it. I would, you know, this kind of thing. And other producers are only people who put money in and, and maybe at the end uh, give you some notes about it. We had a very strong producer on Grizzly Man. And the main thing he did was he said, I want you guys to keep editing until you think it's done, which seems crazy. You would think like every film, you would, that would be the criteria, but it wasn't with Werner. Werner uh, would get very uh, bored with the editing process and he would want to finish it very quickly. So Grizzly Man, um, the producer said to me, I don't care what he wants, just keep editing it. And we'll, if he doesn't want to be there, he doesn't have to be there every day. He can come back in a week. He can see what you've done. So that was a breakthrough because he then, I did do that and the film got significantly, significantly better. And it was a very successful experience for us and it brought him, brought Werner back into the public eye as a filmmaker. He had a kind of down period. And so that film was significant and it was also significant in our relationship, our creative relationship because he began to trust me after that and he began to allow me to have more freedom with the films. It was still, still difficult for me. Um, it's always difficult as an editor, as particularly as I say, I think my problem as an editor is that I didn't, don't really see myself as an editor. <laughs> and so the, the wonderful thing about being an editor is that you go from film to film. So um, if you come to see this film tonight, the director's name is Lynn Ramsey. Lynn Ramsey is a woman, Scottish woman director. She's a very big director right now. She's a fantastic director. She's been around for, I'd say, she's been making films for, I would guess, 20 years, maybe 15 years. And she's only made four films in those 15 years. In 15 years, I made 50 because I went from film to film to film to film to film. So that's the beauty of being an editor. You go from film to film, you get exposed to these amazing filmmakers who have different ways of looking at film, 
and you learn to speak the language of film. Because ultimately, film is a language. It's definitely how I see it. The universal language, it's the language that speaks across all boundaries for the most part. And editors are the people who speak it most fluently because we, because we, we go from film to film and we, we, we learn different ways of making films. Um, that doesn't mean we're more important than the directors or, or camera people, we're not. But, but we actually, when you actually sit down and edit a film, when, you, when you're done and you look at what you've done for the last hour, it's a film, okay? <laughs> it's film. When a camera person does their job and they're done after an hour, there's nothing to look at. It has to still be made into a film. That's true of a director as well. Again, not saying it's more important. I'm just saying that's the difference. Um, the difficult thing about being an editor, or one, one difficult thing about being an editor, for me it was always the most difficult, is there's a, you put everything you can into a film. You, you get obsessed with it. You're thinking about it constantly. You're thinking about it when you're working on it. You're thinking about it when you go home. You're thinking about it when you're lying in bed. You're thinking about it in the morning, the reality of the film is as important as your everyday reality. And that's a weird thing when I look back at my life. It's quite a blurred reality. I, I don't remember very well years. I remember films that I worked on. And so you put, uh, uh, one thing that means is that's how much of my life I put into those films. However, there comes a moment on every film where your job is done and you walk away. And then the, the director and, and pr pr uh, you know, puts the film out into the world, and particularly if you work with uh, these great filmmakers, people have the gen feeling that the director is the person who makes the film. They are the person who is most principally uh, responsible for the film, particularly writer-directors, and I've mostly worked with writer-directors, no question, the film is mostly theirs because they spent the most time with it, they, they, they got it off the ground, but I put, my, I put everything into it for the nine months, the eight months, the six months that I worked on it, and it's very difficult when the day comes that it's not yours anymore. So that I think is basically why um, my entire career, I, I always thought about the day I would not be an editor anymore. <laughs> and um, part of me, uh, as I said, about two years ago, I moved to England, partly to get away from, I'd lived in uh, Los Angeles for 15 years, and it was partly trying to get away from that, um, but also to try to pr pursue my own things. So that's what I'm doing now. I, I'm, I'm writing uh, things for my own my own filmmaking, I'm making films. I'm quite happy, quite happier than I was as an editor, um, although I, I need to start making money. Because I, I haven't been doing that, I've been trying to get films off the ground. I think the last thing I should probably w would want to talk uh, to you about is just simply the other filmmaker, um, the other great, great filmmaker that I've worked with, as I mentioned, is Lynn Ramsey. And that's this film, if, if, how many people are going to go and see this film? Okay, great. And uh, I, should, I should warn you up front, it's a very disturbing film. It's a very dark film, it's a very disturbing film. Um, it's a wonderful, well, I don't want to say it's a wonderful film. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't say that. It's a very interesting film, let's put it that way. And she's an amazing filmmaker. Um, just not to give anything away about the film, but just that what's remarkable about her is, is she's a visual stylist. She, well, she's an image stylist. It's the thing I was talking about before. She speaks in images. Pay attention to the sound in this film. It's quite interesting. And the sound, this was a scripted film, and a lot of the sound things were written into the script, which is very unusual. Um, and you will see that the imagery, it's, there's very little dialogue in this film. It's very much about the imagery, and it's very much about the emotion that drives it. So um, I've, be, I've done two films with Lynn. Um, the other one, this one's called You Were Never Really Here. The other one was called We Need to Talk About Kevin. 
So they're very, I always get them confused, like you were never really Kevin something. But they're very long, strangely long titled films, I don't know why. Um, I love working with her, she's also very difficult, um, but I, I, I feel very, we very much had an had a, a unspoken understanding about the language of the film. I'm very at ease with the language of this film. So I hope you enjoy it. Um, I think we wanted to leave some time for questions.